Hi everybody, it is December 3rd, 2018. I came across this PDF and I feel like sharing it now. Effects of Directed Energy Weapons. I will link to it below. Check out the table of contents, but also check out mm, Effects of Directed Energy Weapons, National Defense University, Center for Technology and National Security Policy. 1994. I believe that was the date. 1994. 1994. Um, table of Contents is quite interesting. Basic Principles. Developing Damage Criteria. This is 369 pages and it goes through the criterion needed, equations needed for particular types of damage, melting, vaporization, energy required for damage, energy density effects, energy delivery rate effects, also speaks of uh, kinetic energy weapons, and microwave weapons, and lasers. And lasers. Anybody doing research on directed energy weapons will want to click on the link, bookmark this PDF, because you have a tremendous amount of references to work off of as you research the directed energy weapons that are being used here in our country. Very obvious in the California fires. One of the reasons why I wanted to, uh, I was excited to do it tonight, is I believe this document explains, though very hard to understand, but I've excerpted parts of this PDF and will read some of it. I think, while you may not understand the particulars, you certainly will understand the just the general concepts but one general concept, why it is we are seeing these singed, defined areas, and right on the other side, absolutely no damage, untouched, you know, like those baseball fields where we see clearly it looks like a fire went through it, but it's so defined and then the other portion of the baseball field is absolutely fine. One of the reasons why we are seeing no debris in the streets, but let me start with the microwave interaction with targets because this, I believe, explains why they are collecting and storing all of our data, our medical data, and uh, psychiatric data because they need that data to exploit our vulnerabilities with microwaves, microwave interaction with targets. Uh, they are unpredictable. They have got unpredictable propagation in the atmosphere. They're unsuitable for hard kill of a target meaning if they hit you with a microwave you wouldn't fall down and die but they're good for soft kills and the soft kill of the microwave directed energy weapons is they do exploit your particular vulnerabilities Uh, any vulnerabilities a target may have to microwaves will depend on its construction. You can be a target. 
or a building can be a target. So when you think about the construction of the human being, every individual has their own DNA, has their own uh, physicality. They want to know your individual genetics and how you are constructed so that they can use these microwaves and exploit your vulnerabilities. If you are, um, if you have the genetics where you are more likely to get cancer, they can use these frequencies to induce that cancer in you. If you have um, a propensity for developing uh, viruses or um, if you've got heart disease, whatever the disease is, if you've got Lyme disease, they can use those frequencies to induce more heart disease, intensify that heart disease, Keep that Lyme disease, keep it alive in you. These microwaves can take from a dormant stage of a virus or a particular bacteria that you have, and they can make it live and make you sick. So those are the vulnerabilities that can be exploited in the human being with microwaves. Interesting that they talk quite a bit about radar and what are we seeing on those sites that I have posted and others post. The next rad radar sites that the use of radar is being used intensely in certain regions of the country. We're now seeing these extremely low frequencies emitted in particular regions of the country and those frequencies are being used against that particular population in that particular region. It's the soft kill of radar, microwaves, the uh, soft kill Microwaves can't blow a target out of the sky, but they can induce an awful lot of disease in you. They can use the same frequency that you have in your brain. That's why they were doing all of that brain research to find out the particular frequencies. And yes, they can actually get your particular frequencies operating in your brain. We are electromagnetic beings, and it is the firing of these electromagnetic frequencies in your brain that uh, operate your neurotransmitters. So when you have these frequencies that are matching the frequency in your brain, and then they increase the intensity, well, they can disrupt the circuitry of your brain. And that's exactly what's happening. That's why a lot of you are experiencing short-term memory loss, a lack of concentration, brain fog, can't think clearly. Um, yeah, they are disrupting the circuitry in your brain. Isn't it a fabulous world? that has developed, isn't it a wonderful environment that we now live in, 24-7, completely dangerous to all life. I will say, not everybody's experience is the same. If you live in an area that has a high concentration of cell towers, Gwen towers, smart meters, Wi-Fi, your circuitry is going to be far more intensely disrupted than someone who lives in a rural area and has a cell tower a couple of miles away from them. 
And I didn't even think that there were areas like that, but I've spoken to two subscribers and they have one tower a few miles away from where they live and that's it. There are pockets um, of areas where there's almost no concentration. So, um, let's get into lasers. Now, I obviously do not understand the equations and I'm not going to be reading the particular um, formulas, equations. Uh, they have different equations for differing uh, targets and they have different equations for differing damage. Melting, vaporization. Yeah, vaporization. Where did we hear that? A plain truth dot info Jamie talking about when he was up in Chico or talking to people who were from paradise and they spoke of people being vaporized well guess what they can do it and this document proves it proves they can do just that and that's exactly what they are doing so, the simplest effect, heating. Uh, absorbed energy will appear as heat. There's no threshold for this effect. As a laser's intensity on target rises, it can begin to melt a hole. Okay, we've seen the Boeing laser, I can't remember what it's called. Uh, they firing a laser and it creates a hole in the hood of a car. So when you're listening to this, the writing is about material, molten material, drilling holes. But think about homes and human beings and all life. Um, once melting begins, it is possible to melt through the target's surface, drilling a hole. They can do that to a human being. At still greater intensities, vaporization becomes possible. Now, the effects in the absence of plasma, melting. Melting the target surface can begin to melt. Uh, they know the melting point of the target's material. The threshold for melting is this equation. In military applications, this is usually not sufficient for damage. We'd like to drill a hole through the target. Yes, we want to do as much damage as we can. So all molten material, metal, uh, the, um, the, uh, I'm sorry, the sinks, the tubs, the, uh, toilet bowls. You need very high temperature to melt porcelain, but it can be done. So all molten material is flushed from the hole, then fresh material will be exposed to the laser light, melt, and in turn be flushed out so that the depth of the hole increases in time. If we assume that molten material remains in the hole, it must continue to heat to the point where it is vaporized if it is to be removed. Removed is a word that comes up very often, removed, meaning gone. That's why you see very little left to the homes that were in a forest fire. No, they used lasers along with plasma and you, if you are of this kind of brain, you can figure out the equations and the computations and everything, but I don't. 
I don't need to. So if we assume that molten material remains in the hull, it must continue to heat to the point where it is vaporized if it is to be removed, which requires much more energy. Some of the molten material will be removed, some vaporized. Um, And yes, they have fabulous illustrations, molten material being removed, target material, hull erosion with molten material removed. Vaporization. If molten material is not removed from the hull, we have no choice but to vaporize it. Requires that the intensity exceed the threshold for vaporization. Heats of vaporization are about an order of magnitude greater than heats of fusion. In general, propagation losses will require that the laser fire with much greater intensities in order to hit the target with the intensity necessary for damage. The mechanical effects, so they can... Uh, create a momentum. Momentum is transferred to a target by vapor shooting from it. In effect, the vapor serves as a small jet and exerts a reaction force back on the target. If sufficiently intense, it can deform the target. Punch a hole through it without the necessity of physically vaporizing and removing the bulk of the material. Deform the target. So, 9-11, you saw steel beams that literally were bent in a very smooth fashion. California fires, you see guardrails bent in a similar fashion. You see piping, a pipe literally like a, a, a pretzel. It just transformed itself and wrapped around a pole. That's because it was with sufficient intensity. The impulse delivered transfers momentum. This momentum drives it down with a velocity and the target therefore receives a blow of energy. The irradiated portion of the target can't just fly away. It's connected to the rest of the target and there are internal forces which seek to hold it together, beams in a house. Damage will be achieved when the energy in the blow from the laser exceeds the strength of the bonds which maintain the target's shape, and it deforms or ruptures. Think about 9-11. Um, the criterion for damage is that the energy in the laser's impulsive blow equal or exceed the energy needed to strain the target to damage. And they know that data. They know what it would take to create the damage that they want in wood, in metal, in porcelain, cars. Effects of plasmas on target interaction. Plasma production. Why is our atmosphere ionized? Plasma? Plasma is ionized gas, which consists of positive ions and free electrons. Our atmosphere is ionized. They can create plasma very easily. So, plasma protect production, particularly from aerosols, the aerosol spraying, the ionization of our atmosphere 
with all of those heavy metals, metal particulates. The target may be considered an aerosol with a very large radius, having a correspondingly low threshold for plasma initiation. Plasma might either help or hinder laser target effects. A plasma exists in close contact with a target surface. Since plasmas are very hot and absorb the laser light well, the absorption of energy in this plasma and its transfer to the target by thermal conduction or radiation could deposit a greater fraction of the laser's energy in the target than if there were no plasma. If a plasma propagates away from the target, it will continue to absorb almost all of the laser light, but very little energy will find its way into the target. Whether they are good or bad will depend upon the laser intensity, which determines the type of plasma and its mode of propagation, and the pulse width, which determines how far a plasma can travel as the beam engages the target. The uh, think about using these labors in an ionized atmosphere. They absolutely can create fire. So it's clear that if a plasma is created in the vapor emerging from a target in a vacuum there is a strong potential for enhanced coupling. The potential for enhanced coupling through plasma ignition is greatest at long wavelengths and increases in absorption by factors of 3 to 10 times. Um, that has been seen upon plasma ignition with infrared lasers. When plasmas are produced over a target surface in vacuum, the result is on average beneficial for laser effects. What can happen when plasmas are produced within the atmosphere? Plasma effects on coupling in the atmosphere? Plasmas could have a much more profound effect on absorption and in the air than in a vacuum. So it must include the effect of light transmitted through the plasma, light re-radiated from the plasma to the target, and the propagation characteristics of the plasma as a function of laser intensity. The intensity of radiation being deposited in the target the integral of Q over time and the instantaneous thermal coupling. The intensity Q includes both laser light and plasma radiation which reach the surface and are absorbed there. There's two different laser intensities. The first supports plasma propagation as a laser supported combustion. The second supports propagation as a laser supported detonation. So when you have the laser supported combustion uh, it's ignited. The absorption is initially very high this reflects the close proximity of the plasma to the target and its effectiveness in absorbing laser energy and re-radiating it to the target. The influence of plasmas on mechanical coupling in the atmosphere, so uh, the pressure in the laser supported detonation can be quite high on the order of 10 to 100 atmospheres, this high pressure as it relaxes towards equilibrium 
with its surroundings will transfer some momentum and impulse to a target over and above that which the target receives as a result of vaporization. The physics of momentum transfer in the presence of detonation waves. So the the uh, laser supported detonation propagating away from the target as the thin absorbing shock front moves forward it leaves behind hot high pressure gases. Gases are initially at the high pressure of a particular um, level associated with the laser supported detonation wave. The laser supported detonation propagates at a supersonic velocity. The hot gases form what is effectively a long cylinder and expand radially to pressure balance as a cylindrical wave front. As the gases expand from their initial radius, the beam radius, to some greater radius, their pressure is reduced. This is entirely um, Wow. Well, brain circuitry, analogous. I couldn't think of how to pronounce it. Analogous to the expansion of the high pressure gases resulting from the detonation of a bomb. Expanding gases exert a pressure on the target surface. The impulse delivered to the target which is the integral of force over time, increases linearly with time until the expanding gases either reach the edge of the target and relax around it, or the pressure in them decreases to the point where it equals the surrounding atmospheric pressure and expansion ceases. An interesting consequence of this is that for small targets the impulse delivered should scale with the target area rather than the beam area. That's why we are seeing very defined lines. That's why we are seeing only the home gone and the surrounding trees, the vegetation, untouched at all because it is the impulse delivered and the the relaxing of the expanding gas the pressure decreases to the point where it equals the surrounding atmospheric pressure the expansion ceases and it's to scale of the target area. So a summary of main concepts. Lasers are intense sources of electromagnetic radiation. When light passes regions, it is bent according to the law of refraction. This can occur either deliberately in lenses or inadvertently since uh, density fluctuations in the atmosphere are there. Um, decreases in intensity resulting both from diffraction and attenuation will reduce the fraction of a beam's energy which can be brought to bear on a target. Beam parameters which may be adjusted to compensate for these effects and enable the delivery of damaging intensities to a target include the energy pulse width, wavelength, and dynamer, di diameter of the beam in the atmosphere if a beam becomes too intense, free electrons in the atmosphere will multiply and the air will break down, forming an ionized plasma, which will absorb the beam. Following breakdown, plasmas can propagate towards the source of laser light as combustion or detonation waves. In the atmosphere, um, the uh, 
what is n? I'm sorry. Sorry, that's the index of refraction. Um, it can vary through turbulence or through expansion induced by the absorption of laser light. The second effect results in beam expansion, thermal blooming or bending. When laser light encounters a target, a fraction of the light is absorbed in the target surface and appears as heat. The thresholds for melting and vaporization are established by the criterion that energy be deposited so rapidly, pulses so rapidly, that it cannot be carried away within the pulse width of the laser. Targets can be damaged either through the erosion, which results from melting or vaporization, thermal damage, or through the momentum transferred to the target surface by an evolving vapor jet that strikes a blow. Mechanical damage. Thermal blooming might be used to advantage with a long duration, low intensity pulse, used to develop an under dense channel with an elevated air breakdown threshold, followed by a short high intensity pulse, which damages the target. Combination of low and high intensity pulses could alternately melt target material and flush it away. In short, there is almost no limit to combinations of effects that might be considered as an aid in achieving target damage. In realistic engagements, it must also be recognized that true damage means more than drilling holes or buckling plates or buckling roads. Yeah. Very dangerous implications. And unfortunately, we are now witnessing directed energy weapons, lasers being used. The campfire, more than 11,000 homes reduced to dust in 24 hours. The evidence I have shown in, on my channel, others have shown on their channels, no forest fire coming into these neighborhoods where the homes were literally brought to dust, vaporized, gone, removed, flushed away. I'll link below to the PDF. Have a good night.